Let us pray. Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. Krista Tibbet, who um, has a show on public radio, a show entitled On Being, suggested this. She said, when all is said and done, none of us will be measured by how much we accomplish, but how well we love. When all is said and done, we're not going to be measured by what we have accomplished, our credentials, what we have, but how well we love. And Jesus tried to say this to a man who came up and asked him a question. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Not... You know, what's going to happen to me when I die? What's it going to be like after I close my eyes in death here? Which people think is the real quintessential question about religion. What's it going to be like after death? Not that. But how can I live my life fully every day here in the presence, in the present? This man was um, a lawyer, and so Jesus uh, responds to him. He says, well, what does it say in the law? And this man was ready for that question because he loved the law. The law, uh, he had studied the law of the Torah, all these these magisterial laws of Moses. And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, which comes out of Deuteronomy. And you are to love your neighbor as yourself, which comes out of Leviticus. And Jesus said, Well, that's right. Love God with everything that you have in your being. Just love God with all that you have. And then love your neighbor the same way. Love your neighbor and treat your neighbor as you would want to be loved and treated. And then you'll have a joyful life. Well, the, the lawyer, you know, he's a lawyer. So he couldn't stop with that. He has to ask one more question. And the question was, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus goes on to tell this magnificent story, probably one of the greatest stories he ever told, probably one of the greatest stories of all, of all time. He tells him this story that even though you may not know much about Christianity or, you know, or Judaism, you do know what a good Samaritan does. The Canadian theologian Douglas John Hall said that this story is the essence of our Christianity. That if somebody came up to you and said, what is your religion about? Then you could essentially answer it with the story of the Good Samaritan. And actually, it's, it's not a, it's really not a simple story. It's got all kinds of nuances to it and subtleties, like any good short story would have. But it seems there was a man, presumably he was a Jewish man, who is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho is near the Dead Sea. 
By the way, this is quite a steep drop. You know, uh, Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. But Jericho is 800 feet below sea level. I guess if you were riding a skateboard, you wouldn't even have to kick. Just, <laughs> you just get on that thing and just roll right on down. You wouldn't even have to do anything. Just enjoy the ride. But it's 17 miles and, you know, it was a rocky place. The, the area surrounded it was known as the, as the wilderness. It was a bleak, arid, hot place with all kinds of bare, bare rock and little uh, plateau areas. Uh, it was uh, quite a good place for brigands, for robbers, thieves to hide. The road still exists today. I've been, been down that road three times. I've, <clears throat> I've been to Israel three times. And I mean to tell you, it's ugly. That area surrounding it is, there's no uh, green, anything around it. It is just barren and rocks everywhere. And so you can understand when you've seen it how this parable speaks a truth. And so, uh, it, by the way, it does exist today. That, that road still is the same. It's the same road. The only problem is there's this huge um, uh, Jewish checkpoint there down about the midway down because uh, on the other side, Jericho is in what we know as the West Bank. And so anybody wanting to go to Jericho has to pass through this Israeli checkpoint, military checkpoint, in order to get through. And if you're on a tour bus, they'll just wave you right through if it has a, has a Jewish license plate. But if you have a Palestinian license plate, guess what? You're going to be there a long time before they let you through. Well, the man is walking down this Jericho Road, and he is mugged. I mean, he's beaten, senseless. He's robbed of his goods. He's stripped of his clothes, all the clothes that he was wearing. And he's left in this ditch by the side of the road. And now comes the part that preachers really kind of like to skirt around and say it real quick so maybe you don't hear it. Because the first person to come by this man on the side of the road is a priest, a religious man. And he sees this guy there on the side of the road who's been beaten near death. And he takes a look at him and then he just walks on by. Doesn't do anything for him, just walks on by. The next one to come by was a Levite who was also a religious man. Uh, the Levites were related to Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. And so they had priestly responsibilities for the temple, the care of the temple. But here he is, he comes, and he actually lingers a little bit. Probably deciding... Do I really want to help this guy or not? But after seeing him, he just skirts on by and leaves him there. Now think about it. Maybe there was a good reason for that, that behavior, that avoidance. Perhaps they had business in Jericho, some important meeting that they had to attend, and so perhaps that was the reason why they just rushed on, rushed on by. Or it could have been a religious reason, because you see, they may have looked at this man and thought that he was dead. And if that were the case, if they touched him religiously, they would have been rendered unclean. They would have been unclean. And that was all about, you know, your acceptability to God was whether you were clean or unclean. 
by the rules that they had established for that. And that's one of the ones that says, no, you can't do that. You're unclean. And then they would have had to go back to Jerusalem, which was a little bit of a trip. And they'd have to go to the temple and they'd have to go through all of these ritual uh, cleanings before they would be made clean again so that then, then they could continue with their, their work. So maybe it was just that they thought he was, he was dead and they didn't want to be bothered with having to, to go through a, a whole rigmarole of getting clean again if they touched him. Or perhaps maybe, and this is what really bothers me, maybe they were just typical human beings. Not bad people, just preoccupied, busy, and they don't want to get involved. You know, I, sometimes I see people who are out there who want me to give them something. I don't know them. I don't know what, what it is they're looking for. And so I kind of give wide berth to that because I'm a busy man. You know, I've got things to do, meetings to attend, church work to do. And I don't know anything. They're just asking something of me. And then as I pass them by, that's when my conscience gets me. And I begin to think of a story about a man who came down from Jerusalem to Jericho and was left in a ditch to die. And then a Samaritan appears. Samaria was the area north of Judea, which is where Jerusalem, that was the, the area that Jerusalem was located in. And they had a similar religion, you know, or, of the Orthodox Jews, but they were absolutely hated by the Jews, absolutely despised by them. Why? Well, in their early history, the area of Samaria was conquered by the Assyrians when they came in. And they took a lot of the people out of Samaria, which is what these conquering countries would do. And they would take them and assimilate them back where their empire was located. And then they bring people in, non-Jews in. And what happened was that the people in Samaria intermarried with these foreigners that were brought in, these Gentiles, non-believers that were brought in. They intermarried with them. When the same thing happened to Israel a couple hundred years later, and they were conquered by the Babylonians and carted off to Babylon in exile, they didn't intermarry. They stayed pure to their race. So when all of that came about where Israel finally was able to go back to its land and begin to rebuild, the Samaritans wanted to help, but the Israelites would have nothing to do with them. They were a hated, despised people. It was almost, you know, that virulent kind of toxic hatred that just keeps on being fueled by tribalism, racism, and religion. It's kind of like the Catholics and the Protestants in Northern Ireland or the Sunni and Shia in Islam who are fighting it over because of certain things that they disagree on. And the same thing with the Israeli Jews and the Palestinian Muslims. This man, in the story, and believe me, hear this, that when Jesus told this story, the people who were hearing this for the first time probably hated it. Because the Samaritan is going to be the hero of the story. This despised man is going to be the hero. They can see it coming. It's the Samaritan. The Samaritan who sees this man and goes to him. 
and cares for him, gives him water, takes oil and he anoints the man's wounds to clean the man's wounds. And then he tears his clothes to make him bandages and he wraps those wounds in these bandages. And then he puts him on his, on his mule and he takes him to an inn. And you know the rest of the story. He delivers this man to this innkeeper and he pays the innkeeper to take care of him. And he said, I'll be back soon and I will take care of any expenses that are still owed. Then Jesus asked this, which of these three was a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? There's only one answer to that, right? Just one answer to it. And the lawyer gives it. The neighbor was the man who showed mercy, compassion, and kindness. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now, do you notice what happened here? The question that the lawyer asked was theoretical. It was abstract. You know, who is my neighbor? Give me a definition of the neighbor I'm, I'm supposed to love so I can live fully. This is what he's asking. He wanted to know some limits. He wanted to know some boundaries that he could have to this, this concern and love uh, that he had to offer somebody who was in a ditch. But Jesus really didn't answer that question. Instead, he defined what a neighbor is. In Jesus' story, a neighbor is anyone who needs you. Anyone who needs you. Anyone who's in big trouble. Anyone who has been beaten and left by the side of the road. Neighbor is the one who needs you, even if he's a person, a person you have every right, you think, to despise. Your neighbor is a human being who needs you. Could be your spouse. Could be your child. Could be a friend, a neighbor. It may be somebody that you don't even know who they are. A total stranger. But the interesting thing here is that the answer Jesus really gave the lawyer was to a question that he didn't ask. How can I be a neighbor and thereby find the essence of my own life? And my beloved Jesus' answer to that question is stunningly simple. Be kind. Be kind, be merciful, care, give, get out of yourself and start seeing and helping other people who need you. Your attention, your love, your strength, your help. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what I'm about to say. In our culture... Religious morality is mostly defined in terms of rules and limits and boundaries. A religion that assures you that you were right and that God is on your side, going to heaven, or righteous, to use a religious word, a biblical word, because of the things you haven't done and you don't do. Jesus, hear it, doesn't seem much interested 
in that kind of religion. Instead, goodness, morality, and righteousness for Jesus is a matter of kindness, of caring, of limitless, unreasonable, counterintuitive love about unconditional love for people around you. The late Kirk Vonnegut uh, told a story about this, or he wrote a story, about this young man from Pittsburgh who, who uh, asked, please tell me it's going to be all okay. And Vonnegut wrote, welcome to earth, young man. It's hot in the summer, it's cold in the winter, it's round and wet and crowded at the outside. You may have a hundred years here. There's only one rule that I know of. For God's sake, be kind. Be kind. As Chris Tibbet um, was working for her divinity degree at Yale University. She did her field work, which was, is required of all divinity students. I did mine at Emory Hospital. But she did her field work as a chaplain in an Alzheimer and dementia floor of the community hospital. She found herself confronted by situations that there just aren't answers in the textbooks. The people she encountered would ask her her name, and they would never remember it. They're not, they were not interested, she said, in my background, my education, the places I'd seen, the titles I held, my credentials. They would only know if I was kind and gentle and patient, a good listener. I could only come to know them and love them just as they were. It was my greatest gift to them, but they gave me far more. And then she says the most surprising thing. She, she started to experience the presence of God in these simple, mostly silent times of gentle kindness. She felt God she said palpably in the silence. I could not begin to take away their suffering, she said. But I sat with it. Sat with them. Sometimes we seem to summon a palpable joy. A redemptive presence larger than ourselves. Small stories of kindness like... The one that I heard from a special interest uh, broadcast that CNN did about this fellow who walked in uh, in Edmonton, Canada, who walked into a Tim Hortons coffee shop and he paid for coffee for the next 500 customers. Don't you wish you'd been in line? The next 500. No, no motive behind that. I mean, he, he just wanted to do a kind thing. And he did. The people were really surprised. But you knew, the news of that went all around Canada. And it began to spread. And then all of a sudden, this became a thing to do. There were people buying coffee for, for people that they did not know all over Canada, thousands of cups of coffee were bought for strangers. And then something began to happen, you know, this kindness begat kindness. Became that the people who had this coffee bought for them were now taking the money that they didn't have to spend on their coffee and they were putting it in a donation cup that had been set out for underserved children and all kinds of money was raised kindness begets kindness 
little stories like that one and about a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. The word here, and Christians believe this is a saving word, a word that can literally save your life. Care. Care. Look around and notice who needs you. Who needs you? Who needs your attention? Who needs your presence, your touch, your strength, your help? The word that can save your life is to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Allow yourself to become a part of God's redeeming and healing work in the world. You know, being present to people who are wounded in life. To give yourself to it, your love, your time, your energy, your money. The saving word here is stop. Kneel by the side of the road or maybe not a road at all, but but at your office, if you have an office or, you know, at the fence with your your neighbor who needs you or perhaps uh, the, the coffee shop that you attend or the bar that you frequent, wherever it may be. Listen, listen, be attentive, and care. Above all, for Christ's sake, literally, be kind. The final saving word in this remarkable little story is that in Jesus Christ, God comes to each one of us. As we're there on the side of the road, broken, injured. God is there lying beside us in that ditch, sitting at our, or sitting at our decks, or while we're lying in a hospital bed, or we're at a doctor's office waiting for a diagnosis that may not be so good, or standing at the ATM, or being here in church. God comes to you. And love, love seeks out human need. God comes with extravagant, unconditional love for you. And you and I, hear this, will not be measured by our accomplishments, our degrees, our credentials, but how we have received that love and lived it out every single day. Sola Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Amen.